2 Peter 1, 8 through 11. This is our scripture this morning. 2 Peter 1, 8 through 11. <clears throat> For if these things be in you and abound, they make you that ye shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But, that, but he that lacketh these things is blind and cannot see afar off, and hath begotten, forgotten that he was purged from his old sins. Wherefore the rather, brethren, give diligence to make your calling and election sure. For if you do these things, ye shall never fall. For so an entrance shall be ministered unto you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, good morning and happy Sabbath. It is good to be back in Delton. Um, I want to thank Jared for the invitation to come and uh, be with you today. Karina, my wife, is here, of course. She was at the piano and uh, always happy to have her with. But it's good to see you. You know, we've been here, I think, Jared, you've had us come about every year for a few now. Yeah. So it's kind of kind of feeling like home a little bit. But it's good to see familiar faces and smiling faces. Um, in the bulletin, you, you receive this card. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it, but this is just to let you know of a service that we provide for you at the conference office. And that is when it comes to the plan giving trust services, will, power of attorney, those types of things. It's a free service. If you do not have that done, please fill the card out and give it to me. I also want you to know that, that if you, um, personal ministries, whatever, whoever's in charge of that, if you're ordering Glow Tracks, uh, Karina's the one you'll be talking to. She's uh, in the publishing department working there. So you'll be able to chat with her a little bit. But we're so happy to be here again. And uh, let's have one more prayer as we go ahead and get started into our message today. Heavenly Father, gracious Thou art, in great grace You give us. We realize we don't deserve this. And I realize as I stand before Your people today, and they have come, Father, because they want to hear a word from You. They don't want to hear a word from me. They want to hear from You. So I just pray that, that I would be lost sight of and that that which you've laid on my heart today, you'll lay on theirs. And I pray that we all will not just hear the words that are spoken from your, your manservant today, but that we'll hear the words spoken by your spirit today and that we'll all go away with that which we need most. So bless us to this end, please. In Christ's name, amen. You know, ladders. How many of you have a ladder? I think we all have ladders, don't we? Um, ladders are a useful thing. They come in all kinds of sizes, and, and they're designed for all kinds of work. You have that little step stool or that step ladder that the housewife uses in the kitchen to get to those higher cupboards. You have that six-foot step ladder that that electrician uses to, to get to that light and change that light fixture. Noah, you've got that eight-foot step ladder that you use as a beekeeper to get that swarm off that tree. There's a 24-foot extension ladder that the, the painter uses to get those high spots to paint the trim on the house. Yes, the list goes on. We could talk a lot more about ladders, but I think you get the idea. Ladders, whether short or tall, can be a helpful thing, and they're designed for one purpose and one purpose only. And what is the purpose? Why are desired? What, what's the design of a ladder? What, what is it for? Tell me. To get higher. You don't need a ladder if you don't need to go higher. Ladders are useful, but they can be very dangerous. Very dangerous. There are a few things I learned about ladders. First, choose a sturdy ladder. Second, make sure it's on stable ground. This is a firm foundation where you're putting that ladder. And third, don't lean too far to the left or too far to the right. Now you may be wondering, Pastor Nephew, how did you learn those lessons? through experience. 
You got time for one more story today? So this happened a few years ago. And as I was in the hospital bed with a couple broken ribs and a punctured lung, I was thinking about these lessons. So I was home on a Sunday afternoon. It was a beautiful July Sunday afternoon. Sun was shining. And I'm a beekeeper. And I have bees, of course. And, and I'm out there on the homestead. We have 10 acres out in the country. And I'm monkeying around, as you do on your homestead, fixing this and fixing that and taking care of this. And all of a sudden, I hear this... And I say, oh, no! One of my, sw- my, bee- my beehives is swarming. Now, that's kind of a bittersweet thing, because as a beekeeper, you don't want your bees to swarm. Because what happens is the population of the hive goes down, they will not produce as much honey. But it's sweet in that, hey, I'll have another colony of bees now. So I'm watching these bees as they're flying around. I'm saying, oh, land somewhere where I can get you. And they're flying around, and sure enough, they land on this limb. It's about nine feet up on this limb. And they congregate, and it's a big swarm. And I'm thinking, yes. Now, this happened right halfway between, well, it was a little closer to, to our garden shed where I had a ladder and to the barn where I have another ladder. Now, in the barn, I had my sturdy ladder, fiberglass, eight-foot ladder, step ladder. In the barn, I had the old rickety wooden ladder. And I'm thinking, because when a, a swarm happens, you end up, they could stay there minutes or they could stay there days. It all depends. I say, oh, I'm just going to grab this ladder. So I grab the rickety old ladder, and I grab a box that I had in there. I throw that ladder down. I'm not really paying attention because I'm looking at the bees. And I, yeah, it's sturdy enough. I start climbing up that ladder. I got my box, and I'm starting to, boom, the bees are all falling in the box, right? And it's, I'm, I'm going further. And, and there's a little, I, I, can, I think I can lean a little bit farther. And as soon as I, ah, the ladder flips down, I fall down, end up in the hospital. Because I had a rickety ladder. I wasn't on a good foundation. And I leaned too far right. Now, when I was in the hospital, an acquaintance of mine told me this saying, When the hair turns gray, put the ladder away. (laughs) Probably pretty good advice when it comes to, I have not uh, taken that advice, I'll, I'll be honest, but it's good advice when it comes to physical ladders. But friends, it's not good advice when it comes to the spiritual ladder. The ladder of sanctification. We're supposed to be getting higher and higher on that ladder as, we, as our hair turns gray or it disappears. We're supposed to be further along that road as we age. If you've turned your Bibles closed, open them back up to our scripture reading. We are going to spend some time here in 2 Peter. In 2 Peter... Chapter 1, starting in verse 8, Jared read this for us, but we're going to come back to it. Three times Peter mentions here these things, and thus that's the title of our message today is these things. He referenced these things. In verse 8, he tells us that if these things are yours and abound... You'll neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. So he's telling us here that these things, you need to own them. They need to be yours. It's not enough that these things are are in in your spouse. It's not enough that these things are, are in your best friend. No, these things need to be yours. Peter says, you must own these things. They must be yours. And it's not enough just that you own them. You know, we own a lot of things, don't we? 
and I'm, don't raise your hand, but how many things do you own that you haven't even used and maybe they even, haven't even seen for years? <laughs> Someone raised their hand. Yeah, we have things. So it's not enough just to, to own it. It's not enough just to own these things and have these things. They must also what? What does Peter say? They must what? Abound. And that word abound there means to increase. They must grow. So it's, it, yes, we must have them, but they must grow. And if they grow, he tells us that we'll neither be barren, and that word barren there in the Greek, useless. We won't be useless, and we won't be unfruitful if we own these things and they abound. Verse 9, he says, for he who lacks these things, who does not have them, is short-sighted even to blindness and has forgotten that he was cleansed from his old sins. So if we do not have these things, we are short-sighted and we are blind. It means that we have lost sight of the goal. What is our goal? Is not our goal to proclaim the everlasting gospel, to prepare a world for the coming of Jesus, and ourselves be caught up with those that have accepted Christ in the air and go with home with him? Is that, that's the goal, isn't it? But have you found in your journey, like I have, that, that there's times when, when that goal seems to get fuzzy? When it seems like that goal starts to get, you know, not so clear? And we start to get short-sighted because we're, we're now focused on the here and now. Just making it through today. If I can just get through today, I'll be happy. And we become blinded. Blinded to that which we need most. And then we, when that happens, we become forgetful. Now you may be saying, well, I am forgetful. <laughs> I can't remember where I put my keys. I can't remember. But this is talking about a forgetfulness that goes way beyond that and is way worse than that. We forget. And what does Peter say? We forget. He spells it out very clearly. We forget that we are cleansed from our old sins. And the moment that happens, Satan says, ah, ha, ha. So that night, when you kneel by your bed in your prayers, he comes and whispers into your ear those sins of your youth. And you start to think, ooh, I thought I, I, thought I asked Jesus to forgive me of that. Maybe he didn't forgive me. Oh, no. And we start to forget that we've been cleansed from our old sins when we lack these things. And then he goes on in verse 10. He tells us that if we do these things, we'll never stumble and we'll have an abundant entrance into the kingdom of Christ. So, we see that we need to have them, we need to own them, they need to be growing and abound in us. We don't want to lack them, we want to do them. Then we need to know not just know, but have them also grow. They must be a fabric, part of the fabric of our very lives. These things need to be. Do you desire to be fruitful in the knowledge of Christ Jesus? Amen. To never stumble, have confidence in your calling, and to be ushered into the kingdom? Then we need to know what these things are. And I'm so happy that Scripture tells us what these things are. Peter outlines it clearly in the verses prior to this, in verses 5 through 7. He tells us what these things are. Now, this has been termed Peter's ladder by many. Others have called it the happiness ladder, the ladder of Christian progress, the ladder of sanctification. Call it what you will. Friends, if we want to be ushered into the kingdom with joy, these things must be ours and they must abound in our lives. Remember, the work of sanctification 
is a progressive work. This ladder is a ladder you take one step at a time. And the idea with ladders are what? For us to go higher. And that's the whole design of this ladder. And, and this is, you're going to find here that this is not just some random list that Peter made. No, there, there's a reason why it goes from the first to the second to the third right on up. Because each one builds on the other. So let's look at this. In verse 5 it says, But also, for this very reason, we'll come back to this, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, to virtue knowledge, to knowledge self-control, to self-control perseverance, to perseverance godliness, to godliness brotherly kindness, to brotherly kindness love. That's the ladder. That's the ladder of sanctification. These words are full of instruction. And they strike the keynote, brothers and sisters, the keynote to victory. Now, verse 5, it tells us, for this very reason. So what, what, what reason? Why is it that we need to be diligent about adding to our faith virtue and adding to virtue? Why? why? What's the reason? Well, in verse 4, he tells us that through those promises, we've been partakers of the divine nature and having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. So because we've come to Christ Jesus, we believe in the promises of, of His Word, we have escaped the corruption that is in the world. So now what Peter is telling us is that, okay, we've escaped it. It's not enough just to, okay, I can... No, you've got to put distance between you and the corruption of the world. It's not enough just to stop that. It's stop it and get away from it. And as we put our faith and trust in Christ Jesus, we have escaped the corruption of the world. But now Peter is saying, now we've got to walk with Jesus in this journey in this, of sanctification, and we need to put distance between us and the world. Amen. For that reason, he says, be diligent. Now in this passage, Peter uses the word diligent twice. He uses it here in verse 5 and in verse 10. But I want you to let you know, in the King, New King James, excuse me, King James Version, it's diligent, but it's two different Greek words. But they're very similar, but they are different. And there's a reason why they're different. Here in this passage in verse 5, when it says giving all diligence, it's the word that means haste, speed. Do it quickly. Now think of it. Doesn't that make sense? You've just escaped from the world, the corruption of the world through Christ Jesus and his word and his promises. Get away as quick as you can. Don't just, well, yeah, mm, yeah. One of these days I will add virtue to my faith. No, as quick as you can start climbing this ladder because we've got to put distance between us and the corruption of the world. Now in verse 10, if you look there, he says there that brethren, be even more diligent to make your call and election sure. Now the word there is effort, earnest, labor. So there, he says, you put earnest labor into making sure that your call and election are exactly what God wants it to be. So why is it important? Why does he, why does he use that word, diligent, in both of these areas at the beginning of this and at the end of it. Well, I believe at the first part, because of the fact that it, it's the word, you know, haste and speed, time is short. And when time is short, you've got to go faster. Now, I've noticed in my life that when we have to go somewhere and we're running late, I tend to drive faster. <laughs> Have you noticed that? For whatever reason, you not didn't get out of the house when you wanted, so now you're like, usually you're trying to stay within the speed limit, at least within five, but boy, I'm going to have to go fast to get there on time, right? Well, that's maybe what it needs to be for us. As, as Paul says, 
we need to redeem the time. Because maybe some of us, we've wasted the time. We should be, we should be up here, maybe on that third or fourth rung of the ladder, but I'm only on the first. Make haste. Time is short. Redeem the time. And it's for our own safety. Put the distance between you and the world. The more distance that's there, now the static of the world, the calls of temptation, won't be so loud in your ear the further away you are from it. And then second, it won't happen by itself. We must cooperate with heaven. We must put effort. We must say, Lord, I want, I want this. I want to work with you to attain this greater heights. But you must want it. I mean, really, really want it. Because you and I both know that the moment, the moment we start to desire to put distance between us and the world, Satan comes to buffet us. And self rises up to thwart our efforts. But we have to remember that Christ came and he died so that we can have it. That we can reach the top of this ladder. That we can have all that he died to give us. That we can have the victory. You know, I like how Jesus puts it in, in Luke chapter 13, verse 24, when he is talking about the narrow way that leads to life and the narrow gate. He says, strive to enter through the narrow gate. Now that word strive means you put effort towards it. It's not going to be easy. Why? Because Satan has thrown all these barricades in front of the narrow door. Strive. We all know that those things that are worth having are worth striving for. So he says here, add to your faith virtue. Now before we start looking at these qualities, that word add kind of jumped out at me. Add to your faith virtue. I came across this, which was so encouraging. It's in the book Upward Look, page 267. Ellen White says, we had better make sure that we are living on this plan of addition. Talking about this passage, adding, 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 adding. But listen to what she says. If we're sure that we're doing that, God will work for us on the plan of multiplication. Isn't that beautiful? So, so when I come to Christ, and now that now, now I, I've, I've escaped the corruption of the world through lust, and I say, Lord, I want to climb this ladder. I need virtue in my life. I want to add that. God says, great. You add it, and I'll multiply it. I mean, that is beautiful. I mean, that's the picture of God. He says, it's just like we do with our kids, right? I remember when our boys were small and, and we tried to teach them, you know, the, 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 just the daily skills of life. And when they would help me cut wood when they were small, and they're, they're, they go to pick one up, I'm pick, who's lifting up that, that chunk of wood more? Me or my little boy who's six? I am. I'm lifting up the majority of the weight, and, and I'm like, oh, wow, this is heavy, isn't it? And he's like, whoa. Oh. But if he didn't put the effort to pick one up, then I, I couldn't help him, right. right? So we make the effort, and God brings it in, and he says, I multiply it. I'm here. So he says, and then it goes on to say, he will multiply unto us grace and peace. Let us fix our eyes on the cross of Calvary and behold the sacrifice of Christ to secure for us this life insurance policy. I like that. Life insurance policy. You add, I multiply. <laughs> That's God's life insurance policy. So we are to add to our faith. So it all starts with faith, doesn't it? And we've talked, and Dave, thank you for the lesson this morning. Um, our lesson this week dealt with this issue of faith. And we're to add to our faith. See, faith is that solid ground that we place a sturdy ladder. It's that level ground, that firm foundation. 
That's where the ladder must stand. If it's not on faith, that ladder will not hold you up. It's faith in Jesus, His Word, His promises. Hebrews 11.1 1 tells us, let's just turn there, I know we, we referred to that in uh, Sabbath school, but let's, Hebrews 11 verse 1, it says, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, and the evidence of things not seen. So it's the substance of things hoped for. If you're hoping for something, have you already received it? No. If you have it, you don't have to hope for it. But you see, this kind of faith that God wants us to have is a faith that believes I have it even though I haven't seen it. That it is mine. Even though it's not been, it is mine. Verse 6 tells us it's impossible to please God without it. But I like also what Paul brings in in Romans chapter, what is it, 12, verse 3, that God has dealt each one a measure of faith. So God has given to everybody a firm foundation that they can put that ladder on if they want to. So everyone has a measure of faith. And that addition multiplication principle works. That if I take that little bit of faith, God will start multiplying that faith. And now i got a, a solid foundation. So I can start to add to my faith these characteristics of Christ. So once we have that firm foundation, we can add to it virtue. And virtue there is moral excellence, goodness, modesty. Those are some of the ways it can be defined. It's exhibited in, in, in our life, what we do, where we go, how we walk, how we talk, how we dress, everything. Moral excellence. In the book, My Life Today, page 96, we find this. After receiving the faith of the gospel, our first work is to seek to add virtuous and pure principles. And thus, cleanse the mind and the heart for the reception of true knowledge. Where do we find those kind of principles. Friends, you don't find those principles on the internet. You don't find those kind of principles in this world. You can't look to the world leaders of today or at any time and say, well, I can find moral excellence there. There's only one place to look, and that is Christ Jesus. As we look to Jesus, as we look and we see him in, in the word, now we have a pattern. And our minds and our hearts will be cleansed so we can truly receive knowledge. Not a false knowledge, but the true knowledge. And that's what we're to add. Add to virtue, then knowledge. And this knowledge, like I mentioned, is the true knowledge of understanding God's ways. Understanding the ways that God has worked out salvation for this planet. It's the truth as it's found in Jesus. It's as Peter mentions in verse 8, that we won't be unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. And then he says that we're to add to knowledge self-control. Self-control. That's a tough one. It's tough to have only two cookies when there's a dozen on the platter. It's tough to have that self-control of saying, no, I'm only going to go this far. I'm only going to do this. I'm not going to retaliate. You know, that person cut me off on the way to work. I'm not going to do that which maybe my carnal heart is 
calling me to do, self-control. In the book, My Life Today, it tells us that it's impossible for an intemperate person to be patient. That's pretty strong. It's impossible for an intemperate person to be patient. So what does that mean when Pastor Joel is impatient? It means I've been intemperate. And it could be I stayed up too late, didn't get the sleep I needed, so now I'm a little on edge the next morning. Right? So then I'm a little less patient. So self-control comes in, it can only come in after we have this knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ because we understand that we must surrender all to Him and it's no longer self-control, it's Christ controlling me. And then we add this perseverance or this patience which is Cheerful endurance is being brave and steadfast under adversity. You know, this perseverance, it, it seeks for unity. Unity in the church, in the family, in the community. And this grace must also be woven right into the fabric of our lives. And then we see godliness. It means piety or holiness. And this, this can be um, uh, a word of contention, it seems like, in some circles. This idea that God calls us to be holy. Friends, He does call us to be holy. The Bible says it. If I don't agree with that, then that's, that's on me, not on God. But God calls me to be holy. But if He calls me to be holy, what does that also mean? He makes it possible. He makes it possible. But you see this progression, right? We have a good, solid foundation of faith. We add to that moral excellence, knowledge of Christ Jesus and the ways of salvation. Self-control comes in. I have patience now. Now God can trust me with holiness. And it's not a holier than thou. It's not this idea that, well, I'm going to come in next week and I'm going to, I'll show everybody what holiness is. No. I mean, how did Jesus, how did he do? That's how it's supposed to be. We're supposed to have the spirit. We're supposed to have the attitude of Christ. That's what holiness is. The likeness of Jesus. And once we have that, then we can have, we can add to it brotherly kindness, this Philadelphia. Go to 1 Peter chapter 3. Let's go to 1 Peter chapter 3. I like how, how Peter puts it here, starting in verse 8. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 8 says, Finally, all of you, be of one mind, having compassion for one another. Love as brothers. Be tender-hearted. Be courteous. Let me just back up for a minute. Love as brothers. How many of you have a brother, a blood brother? You grew up with brothers. Okay. I grew up with brothers, two older brothers. And I want to tell you this. There were times I did not love my brothers. My brother Mark, he's two and a half years older. Uh, we, we buried a lot of hatchets, <laughs> as they say. But there were times my brotherly love, my brotherly kindness toward him was not there. But I tell you what anyone else come up against me or up against him, then all of a sudden what? That brotherly kindness, it was there. No, no, I can hit my brother, but you can't. <laughs> right? I, I can do whatever to my, but you can't. We had our disagreements. But in the end, well, we stood side by side when we had to stand side by side. And Peter's saying, we need to have this brotherly this brotherly love, this brotherly kindness among us. It doesn't mean we have to agree on everything. It doesn't mean that, well, I've got to cower down in every situation. No, I can still have my opinion. I can still voice it. But we still love each other. 
and we separate that issue from the person. Be tender-hearted. Be courteous. Not returning evil for evil or reviling for reviling, but on the contrary, blessing, knowing that you were called to this, that you may inherit a blessing. For he who would love life and see good days, let him refrain his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit. Let him turn away from evil and do good. Let him seek peace and pursue it. For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are open to their prayers. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. Back in that book, Upward Look, she tells us that the Lord will not accept the work of any man that is not done in tenderness and love and kindness. You can do the right thing for the wrong reason. And that's not acceptable to God. It has to be done with tenderness, love, and kindness. And that's why that's one of the rungs of the ladder back in 2 Peter. Brotherly kindness. And then we come to love. We add to brotherly kindness love. That's agape. That's that divine love, that self-sacrificing love where I am willing to die for your good. It's the crown of grace. Paul says in Colossians 3.14, above all these things put on love, which is the bond of perfection. We should have that kind of love for others that Christ has for us, right? But we can't create such love that only comes when we have allowed Christ to work in me this work of sanctification to bring me to that point. The higher we go on this ladder, the more of God's grace is revealed in our actions, our thoughts, and the very values of our life. These are these things. And we're told this, Testimony Volume 6, Christ, who connects earth with heaven, is the ladder. The base is planted firmly on the earth in his humanity. The topmost round reaches the throne of God in his divinity. The humanity of Christ embraces fallen humanity while his divinity lays hold upon the throne of God. We are saved by climbing round after round of the ladder, looking, listen to this, looking to Christ, clinging to Christ, mounting step by step to the height of Christ so that he is made unto us wisdom, righteousness, sanctification, and redemption. Faith, virtue, knowledge, temperance, patience, godliness, brotherly kindness, and charity are the rounds of this ladder. All these graces are to be manifested in the Christian character. If these things are yours and abound, you'll neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But if we lack these things, we're short-sighted on the blindness and we've forgotten the redemption. We've forgotten the forgiveness. But if these things are in our lives and we're doing them, friends, we'll never stumble and we'll have an abundant entrance into the kingdom of our Lord Jesus Christ. I think it's time to take a good, hard look in the mirror. Not looking at each other, but look in the mirror. And we have to ask, honestly ask ourselves, are these things mine? And do they abound? I pray that for each one of us, our honest answer before God 
would be, yes, these things are mine. And they abound. And you know what? I'm not just saying that. Ask my wife. She'll tell you they abound. Ask my boss. He'll tell you they abound. Ask my pastor. He, he'll tell you they abound in me. But if not, if not, know that right now, this very second, you can start climbing the ladder. This very second, you can, through faith in Christ Jesus, claim these things as yours and pray that He will have them increase in your life. By simply putting your trust, your faith, in Jesus Christ. By putting your full confidence in the facts that, that He can save you from your past and your present sins. That He's willing to transform you into His likeness. That He is willing to usher you right into His kingdom. But the question as it always is, as is that our desire. Is it your desire to go higher on this ladder? It's kind of painful. It's not always easy. But it's a successful climb Amen. if we climb it with Christ. Let's pray. Oh, Father, how thankful we are for this ladder called Christ. We're so thankful, Lord, that you love us so much that you want to change us from being like us to being like Jesus. Help us. And, Father, we're not looking at this as a list of do's. We're just looking at this as a, a ladder to, to separate us from the world and get us into your kingdom. And, and you've said that if we, we own these things and abound in them, we will have true knowledge and we will be ushered into the kingdom. So please work these graces out in our lives and help us not to hinder and push the forces of darkness back that your light may truly shine upon our path. And we ask this in Christ's name. Amen. Amen.